Hey, what's going on? Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Billy Newman Photo Podcast. I am hanging out in the car today, and I'm doing a quick update on my to-do list. It's kind of one of the things I'm, I don't know, I'm going to try and do. But uh, I'm going to run through some of the updates that I have going on. And it's really just like kind of talking about a lot of the, the media stuff that I'm trying to get done through my day or kind of talk about a little of the, the process of what uh, what I'm trying to produce and promote and get out there. And uh, I don't know, it'll be kind of fun, but uh, I've got a couple photos that are going to be going out today. And I got like a couple other things I'm going to try and find and post and uh, I'll get this podcast out there too. But I've been trying to set up like a, a media schedule every morning, like where I have a, a certain layout of things. And I think I've been thinking about about six posts a day, somewhere around four or five or six posts. A lot of the time it's like two images, and I'm interested in filling the rest in with uh, with some links out to, to some of the, the cool stuff that I've got figured out or the, you know, the, the photos and stuff that are coming together. But it really seems like almost all my effort or a lot of the attention that I have right now is, uh, is going to put up fresh media content or, well, just fresh, just new stuff on Instagram every day. I feel like that's where a lot of the attention uh, is. And it's kind of cool uh, sort of setting back on Twitter and setting back on, uh, on like, I don't know, LinkedIn the website itself and other stuff. And uh, I really want to go in on, well, probably YouTube, audio podcasting, like what we're doing now, and then uh, and then Instagram posts. I really I appreciate Snapchat stuff for some of the, the like personal sending stuff, but I've I really found like uh, Instagram to be pretty interesting in trying to share a lot of the the photo stuff, or well, at least like anybody in the creative side or the arts side. It seems like it seems like Instagram has a really big community around that of younger people that are talking about it uh, more constantly. That seems kind of interesting. And you know, I've really been looking at like uh, the business development stuff on Instagram. It seems like it's worked a little bit on like the LinkedIn side. Really weird that I would say LinkedIn was a good business development tool for me. But, you know, I should talk about that first. That's on my list today. Today is like the first day of, um, of the Lane County Fair. And they had talked to me uh, a little while back. Like the coordinator for Lane County Events had talked to me about uh, being, a photogra- being the commercial photographer for the, the media stuff at the fair. And I thought that was really cool. That was really exciting. And I don't know how to negotiate my deals. I wonder if anybody else out there that's a photographer that knows about pricing and day rates and that sort of stuff for, uh, for like, getting out of – or, well, just for, for running your own business. I mean, what do you have to charge an hour or for a day rate for yourself to really make money? And it sounds weird to say, but, like, I was just talking to another photographer this morning – they said the day rate for a photographer is $2,500 a day now. That's what he would charge to shoot for a day. And this gig at the, the fair had, would have someone working for five days, five days to shoot, and then provide ownership of those photographs back to that organization. That's $2,500 worth of work a day. That's crazy. That's, that would be like... $7,500, $8,000 if they were getting paid out as the commercial photographer for a five-day event for, like, a, a county thing. I don't like they would pay that, I suppose. But maybe they do. I have no idea what they'd actually pay. I probably would have way undercharged them. I mean, goodness, I get paid, like, a, a poor hourly rate as it is now, and that I thought was pretty cool. <laughs> to get paid for photos. So this guy I talked to earlier, though, he yeah, $2,500 a day, like big time residual checks and big time, like I don't understand any of that pricing. So I thought it, it was interesting to kind of conflate these two stories of what it costs to get a, or what a day rate for a photographer modern day is. This guy said $2,500. Another photographer that I had talked to, he had said $1,500 a day. That was back in the 90s. Yeah, I remember he prefaced it with back in the 90s, it was $1,500 a day to get out and do something. And now it would be astonishing if I made $500 a week. Ugh. <laughs> That's a different type of economics. Um, but yeah, so this fair deal, like I'd put up a bunch of photographs and I've been trying to put up a bunch of links, like I'm kind of talking about this content schedule. And uh, I've also been trying to network and do business development with a lot of people. And I've really been pushing to do that on LinkedIn. I should push a lot more on Facebook. And I should really kind of work to promote and uh, 
I just do a lot there, but but I've been doing a lot of business development on LinkedIn and on Instagram, and I got contacts back, which was cool to like do the fair in town. It was great, just kind of cold called, hey, we want you to come be the commercial photographer for the fair this year. That's almost never happened for me for uh, for photo jobs before. So part of it made me realize I need to be uh, well, and part of talking to this guy about. An expensive photography day rate makes me realize, oh, I'm in the wrong kind of business. I'm not on the lucrative end of business. You know, I really need to just be telling these companies, hey, that's uh, five grand to have me for a week. (laughs) I don't know, but (laughs) that seems, in my mind, from where I've come from, that is ridiculous. Uh, But I guess that's the way to go. So what do you guys get paid, huh? You guys listening, are you guys going to charge $2,500 a day to take photos of an event? Maybe you're worth it. I don't understand why. Uh, we'll look into this guy's stuff today. Man, my stuff is parody for sure. And uh, it's, it's interesting to see how, uh, how different photographers price and sell their work. And it's weird how they kind of uh, package it and build it into a business part of it. And I know that's the hugest part about turning what you're interested in into a way to make money is sort of transitioning that from just your interest and what you occupy your time on to manufacture to really what you're able to deliver or uh, or to, to deal out and to put out in scale to to people and businesses and you know I don't know some kind of commercial activity where you can get paid from man that's something I really need to figure out something I really need to figure out <laughs> So the first thing I wanted to talk about was the changeover in the workflow that I've been working on, uh, probably for most of the month of, of June and July so far. But uh, back in June, probably mid, late June, I'd uh, talked it over with Marina, and I decided that it's time for me to sell all of my Nikon gear. Every Nikon camera I have is going. See ya. Uh, in fact, I still got a couple film cameras. If you want one, give me a call. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I have a couple, uh, well, I've, I've just kind of collected like a a mass of very inexpensive cameras, camera bodies, lenses that have all kind of come from thrift stores or used gear or things that have been handed down or kits that have sort of compiled themselves over time. Uh, and so I have like, uh, countertops full of, of sort of strange off pieces of camera equipment. A lot of it really is like five to fifteen dollars of value, like old Pentax lenses or old Olympus lenses that are sort of off-brand Vivitar from the late seventies, eighties. And there's cool stuff in there. And there's a couple Nikon things that were okay glass, but but really overall, it was very dusty, very kind of this will sort of work or this would be fun to try out sort of stuff that was uh, that was just kind of left with me ultimately. Like a lot of like there's a, like a Canon AE one. I'd never shot it before, but. It was uh, picked up at an estate sale and given it to me. Um, you know, so there's like a big collection of all these cameras that I'd had and all parts of systems that I don't use and all parts of the Nikon system that I do use. But what I was noticing is as happy as I was with the D3 body that I've been shooting with over the last year and as much as I like shooting with film and shooting with the Nikon F4 and the Nikon Glass and all that, it's been great. But what I noticed really is that It's just kind of behind the time, or maybe what I noticed, behind any judgment about Nikon being better or worse than what I could get outside of it, what I noticed most is that I'm tired of it, or is that uh, I'm kind of creatively looking to get rid of, like what I just mentioned, this desk full of bits and pieces of glass that can't really be used and can't really be implemented. Like, it's 30 pounds, like it's a huge amount. I put it all in this big box and I shipped it off. It was super heavy. It was like a big, large box full of stuff. That's all gone. I shipped it out. I've sold it. I pulled in the couple grand that all that stuff is cumulatively worth. And then I'm going to reinvest that and try and buy newer equipment and really focus in on uh, on buying like nicer, higher end glass. That's been the issue that I've had for the longest time as a photographer is that uh, all of my investments in glass have been the investments of a college student. And that was pretty limited. Like I was astounded. I was so excited. Oh, <laughs> I wonder who was paying for all my peers' camera equipment during my time in college, but I was ecstatic to get the Nifty 50 for Nikon, the, the Nikon 50mm 1.8 uh, 
AFD lens. It was this like $119 lens that you can still buy on Amazon or anywhere else. And that's the one that actually I'm still keeping. I have that, I have that 50 millimeter and the N80, the N80 film camera that, uh, that was my cousin Lawrence from more than a decade ago. Uh, those two are sticking around really because uh, aftermarket, used market stuff, you can probably only sell that for like 60 or $70. And I think it's worth more than that. I love using it. All my favorite photos are shot kind of with that film set up, a full frame, 50 millimeter, and, uh, and like a good film stock on a good Nikon. Or, that's great. I'm super pumped for it. And especially right now going through this doldrum of not actually having a, a full setup for a digital camera, I think, uh, I think it's great. But I sold the 28, I sold the 400, or the, you know, the 80 to 400 millimeter. I sold a 14 millimeter and I'm going to reinvest all of that stuff back into Sony. I decided, I think, uh, I was looking at Fuji for a while. I was looking at some other stuff, but I really see Sony and the, the higher end, uh, professional range, full frame, Sony, uh, mirrorless SLRs being sort of the direction that I see a lot of the, f nah, just the last couple years of photography and maybe the next couple years of photography going in. In fact, I, I would really say that Sony is surprisingly taken over the photography market or at least gained a huge amount of ground during this decade from like 2011, 12 on with the NEX 6 and 7 line and then the A5000 and 6000 and then 6500 and all on from there. All of that stuff is just way more advanced than the old alpha line of Sony equipment that had been in the past. But I'm really interested in the E-mount system and the Sony A7 or A7R, the Sony A9. That'd be really cool. Even though I hear the Sony A9 overheats, like your iPhone overheats when you leave it on the sun on your dashboard, it'll overheat like a device. I never had any problem, any heat problem or any processor problem like that with the technology in the D3 or the D2H. Those are workhorses that I used you know, in plus 100 degree heat all the time. So I never really put it through like a, a really deep wedding where there would have to be like 2,500 frames put on the camera during a couple hours. But during like the river photography stuff that I used the D2H with, I mean, that was, you know, more than 100 degrees a day. And I'd shoot about 800 photos a day. And I did that sustained from June till September. And that was all a workhorse that worked fantastically. It was always great. So it's interesting to kind of hear that as we build up in, um, in making these cameras devices, like electronics devices, which I think is, is more what we see in the A7, A7R, A7S line. Like the camera has a touch screen or, you know, it has apps on it. Like what camera has downloadable apps and a Sony app store to put HDR photos together or panoramas together, whatever kind of like little piece of technology can use to, to build photographs. It's kind of interesting that they're including that stuff now, as opposed to just... Uh, just the raw file. Of course, the pros are going to focus on that use of it, but it's interesting that there's sort of this pairing of, of device features in the Sony line and then really high-end professional features. It's kind of interesting how it's sort of splayed across the two. And to talk just for another second, you know what's kind of interesting is as I'm talking about transferring over my personal photography equipment over to the Sony a7R and some and what I'm looking for is good prime lenses right now. That's what I'm kind of after. But uh, that's what I'm trying to do with all the personal photography equipment this summer before before I end up with like a wedding or two that I have in late August and, and September. And uh, on that same note, at work, like for all the production photography that I go through, I, uh, I picked up a Sony A6000 and a flash. What flash is this? It takes like two double A's. Is that a flash? How, how much flash is that? What is this one? The HVL F32M flash. Takes uh, two double A's. This little uh, Sony, A A uh, Sony A6000 is a super small, compact, very usable camera. It's interesting how like the electronic viewfinder works. I've not worked with the camera with the EVF yet. And it's a little bit strange to get used to, like seeing a lot of the, the histogram information and the, the digitally displayed graph of information about your exposure information. It's sort of, it's sort of weird to get used to. I'm, I'm so used to just that number line and, and that sort of graphic system that had been around for the last however many gajillion years between Canon and Nikon. It's just sort of seems standardized. But now you're seeing this 
this heads up display system of moving numbers sliding back and forth kind of digitally imprinted over the top of the photograph as you see it and take it and what you see is what you get when you take it it's very fascinating how that part of it works and it's been kind of interesting but but all in all it's been cool and uh it's been kind of interesting getting used to shooting more production stuff and man oh my gosh it's so much lighter it's like a pound it's half a pound it's fantastic so all in all i think that's most of the stuff that i have to talk about about uh my photography stuff for this episode of the billy newman photo podcast thanks for listening to this update